Good morning. I, uh, I always like to, to begin any conversation by explaining what I do, so you can completely ignore everything I say after that, or at least discount it. I uh, kind of like KGS. No one ever calls me when they're having a good day, right? You know, and, and I get the call from the woman in Harlan County who calls and says, Mr. Fitzgerald, the state told me to call you, so you know they don't want to deal with it. And, and um, there's a man in a moon suit on the other side of the fence, and he's digging dirt and putting it in a baggie. So I immediately knew somebody's in full containment and is taking a soil sample. And she says, and I went over and I asked him what he's doing. And he said, ma'am, there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> and, she said, and she said, I don't know whether to believe him or not. So, well, it turns out she had good reason to be a little nervous because um, what he was doing is taking a sample of a, uh, a shop that had for years been degreasing mining and transportation equipment and dumping the spent solvents into a dry well where it cross-contaminated at least three aquifers, including the fracture flow aquifer, which was serving as the water supply for the trailer park next door. The community is called Day Hoyt, and many of you have been up the Clover Fork, know where Day Hoyt is, and it ended up on the national priority list for the Superfund. So she had good reason to be concerned. Those are the sorts of calls I get. No one ever calls and says, the brooks are babbling, the air is pure, the ground is uncontaminated, and I just thought I'd call because I wanted to say hi. Um, you, you all get the calls. Probably my favorite was, was the time that um, uh, Dr. Ewers, who some of you have had classes with Ralph, right? He, he was my go-to and remains my go-to guy for, for geoscience when it comes to karst, right? He is the guy who literally wrote the book. Well, I had asked him to be an expert in a, in a landfill case. Somebody had chosen a site that if I asked you to choose the most inappropriate place to put a landfill, you could not have done better. Right? <laughs> it was actually a conglomeratic sandstone deposit, an old channel fill from back in you know, days past that they wanted to put a landfill on top of. And this is back when we were putting 12 inches of compacted clay and considering that to be adequate to to manage and control the mixed municipal waste that we were dumping in there. And after the cross-examination that I did on the uh, expert for the landfill company, who happened to have been the guy who drew the map okay, for that particular geologic quadrant, right? he gets off the stand and he puts his arm around Dr. Ewers, who's an old friend of his, and they walk out and he says, Ralph, why is it that they never ask our advice? They just want us to bless their mess. And I was like, oh, that's, I've got to write that down. They just want us to bless their mess. I, I left at the, the opportunity to be here today, okay? Because I'm a complete geek, okay? And, and, I, and I love to be in the company of geeks, of unapologetic geeks, when it comes to geoscience. The, and, and if I could distill down what, what I have to say, because we're running a little bit behind, so I'm going to actually be, be more brief than usual. Be, having been, having, I heard Cobb laugh when I said that, having been vaccinated with a Victrola needle, as my mother said, it's kind of hard for me to be brief about anything. But, but the message is this, science does matter, and what you do has value, and create value. Right. And, and I looked, I read the strategic plan, I made some notes as I was driving over, which you're probably not supposed to do. Um, and so, so looking at my notes, I need to go like this a little bit in order to read them because the car needs to be aligned a little better. But, but I wanted, to, I wanted to, to just talk, kind of bookend my message with two stories, right? Because you all write reports, I tell stories. And the, the first was, when the Commonwealth of Kentucky decided that they wanted to take over the mining program under the 77th Surface Mining Act, they had to deal with the fact that they were transitioning a lot of surface mining operations and a lot of surface areas overlying underground mining operations into the program very quickly. They needed geologic data on the groundwater. They came up with this shorthand way of avoiding the collection of groundwater data called geologic isolation. If you could pull a core sample out of your proposed mine plan 
and show that there was a sufficient amount of underclay in the core sample, you would not have to collect groundwater data. Because the thought is that the water that's going to fall from the heavens is going to hit that underclay and not go anywhere. So we challenged that in the case of Little versus National Mines. Clayton Little was, was, was a former state legislator and, and he was an icon, um, famous for, uh, for some issues regarding gambling many, many years ago. But uh, the, uh, we challenged the idea that, that that had anything to do with science, right? And there were two places we were able to find data to find reports that explained how surface water and groundwater interact in a hydrologic cycle in eastern Kentucky. We went to Borchers and Weirich, who I think had done their work with the Corps of Engineers in West Virginia when they were doing foundational work over there. But we didn't have to go very far because there were three researchers with the Kentucky Geological Survey who working with industry had developed a conceptual model of groundwater flow in Eastern Kentucky, Kip, Dinger, and Barnes, right? That was our Bible when it came to dealing with these issues. And we were able through using uh, the administrative litigation and, and bringing a pattern and practice lawsuit against the Commonwealth to get them out collecting data based on that conceptual model. What you do has value. It has value to all those people whose wells are finished into the alluvium of the creeks of eastern Kentucky, whose groundwater depends on the fact that somebody is paying attention and somebody is managing the on-site and off-site impacts of mining. The other story I want to tell you is about Norm. You're like, who's Norm? Um, I didn't know what Norm was until, uh, until I got a call from uh, Dr. John Volpe. Dr. Volpe was over at the, the uh, Division of Public Health. He was the state radiation control officer. And he said, I think we have a problem in the Martha oil field. Now, many of you know the Martha oil field was heavily produced you know, for, for nigh on 100 years. And um, the, the amount of production in the field was such they said you could walk from one drill pad to the next with ever, without ever putting your feet on the ground. And what had happened is the, the, they had overpressured the formation in their efforts to, to water flood the fields and had caused contamination of drinking water supplies and EPA ordered them to shut the field in. Well, even though we knew from, or in retrospect, should have known from North Sea data that there was radionuclides associated with production from certain geologic formations, EPA had not gotten the memo. And when they were asked, what do we do with these old pits that have the brine and the sludges from this production? Uh, what do we do with them? EPA said, oh, just bulldoze them because they'll, they'll uh, photo remediate over time. And so they took discrete little problems where scale had occurred from these, from these drilling operations and had accumulated over time and had levels of radium-226, which is the particular radionuclide of concern, uh, well in excess of what you would see from regulated low-level radioactive waste. Right? And they took a discrete problem and smeared it all over farmland in Lawrence and Johnson County. So I get the call from Volpe saying, you need to come out and look at this. So we did, went out and uh, Ashland finally, they agreed to clean it up, got cleaned up. The, uh, there's still, you know, there's some lawsuits. The lawsuits were not successful in terms of, of compensating people for the loss of value of their lands and things. But, but at least the contamination got dug up and moved to a place where it's, it's securely on plastic and under plastic right now. But then you fast forward, oh gosh, how many years? That was 93. Fast forward to 2016. And through an unfortunate set of circumstances, Esco County and Greenup County end up becoming the unwitting hosts of some wastewater sludges from recycling fracking waters out of Pennsylvania and Ohio by way of West Virginia. These are well-traveled sludges. And they end up in Eastern Kentucky in a landfill. So then the question is, what do we do going forward? And I've got to say that it is, it is not easy to be an honest broker 
of scientific information, particularly as you get closer to the political flame, right? Because you get accused of being partisan, you get accused of taking sides, you, you get in the way of decisions that are not intended to be grounded on sound science, but in fact are contrary to sound science because they're being driven by some other short-term um, exigency or desire, right? Which usually has money behind it. But it has been, uh, and I've got to say Rick Bender has done an amazing job. I've had the privilege of working with him for many years in different, you know, when he was over at the Division of Oil and Gas, and now he is an advisor that is trying to corral a work group into developing sound policy on naturally occurring radioactive materials and enhanced materials and how we manage them in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And he's done an exemplary job of it. But that conversation would not be an informed conversation if Brandon were not part of that conversation because he has, as he has done in many of his public speaking around the state regarding hydraulic fracturing, regarding uh, nitrogen foam frack as opposed to water fracking and some of those issues, has helped to inform the conversation and has helped to develop what shortly will be unveiled as I think one of the preeminent policies in the nation for how to rationally and reasonably manage the risks associated with radionuclides that are generated as part of the oil and gas development process. A lot of states overregulate, some states underregulate. I think we've hit the sweet spot, and Brandon's involvement has helped to ground that conversation. Right, and so again, what you do has value. The uh, the I, I did wear this so you know that I can dress like an adult occasionally. Um, I wore my legislative shoes. I'm going to end up by telling you the story about the legislative shoes. But I read the strategic plan. And strategic, strategic plans are great things. After managing the Kentucky Resources Council for 33 years, we developed one. Um, and it, it was really, it was kind of, we've also had our first annual meeting last year. Um, and, and, you know, some things should not be rushed. Um, but one of the things that, that I realized is, is when we did some outreach to folks and we asked them, what do we do that has value? What do you perceive as our strengths, as our weaknesses, as the opportunities, you know, the SWOT analysis? And, and we got some feedback. Some of it was really positive, some less so. And so we have changed a little bit of the way that we deliver our services, which is legal aid uh, and technical assistance on environmental issues for people that can't find or afford representation. We have a completely unsustainable business model. We don't take corporate money. We don't take government money. We don't take cases where there is an opportunity for fee recovery because I can get private attorneys to do those. Right? So we represent the folks who call and say, I don't know what to do here because I'm concerned. Um, you provide an incredible value. And I looked at the different you know, metrics that you had in the strategic plan. And there were a couple of things I, I saw that weren't emphasized nearly enough, and I want to just talk about those briefly. One of them is how you measure value, right? You provide services free of charge that are readily accessible. Right? I represent folks who can't afford experts, right? So when I have a case and I'm looking at somebody who wants to site a landfill in the middle of a conglomeratic sandstone formation, or somebody who decides they want to land farm sludges, partially treated sludges in a karst area, or somebody that wants to expand a mining operation next to an incredibly ecologically important cave, right? I go to a source that I can trust. Now, it's kind of funny, the, the, uh, the science march that happened recently, they need to work on their messaging. Right, because you know, like, like no justice, no peace. That's got a kind of a ring to it, or you know, hey ho, so and so has got to go. That that has a kind of a cadence. The 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 phrase that they were using. What do we want? We want science informed policy. When do we want it? When it's peer reviewed, right? Yeah, but that doesn't have the same ring. So you need to really consolidate that a little bit. But that is the goal, right? When you look at a state that, that is the fourth poorest state in the nation on a per capita basis, but has this tremendous wealth of resources, of natural resources, of human resources, and we keep doing the same thing and we keep expecting a different outcome, right? 
We get out of that by having informed conversation. Conversation that is informed even sometimes when people don't want to be informed because we're quite comfortable in our ignorance. Thank you very much. It is, I think, critically important that, that KGS not shy away from being that honest broker of information, even when that information is not received in a, in a, a positive way because you're getting close to that intersection of politics and policy and economics and science, right? And science is kind of, you know, is something that some people don't want to know about, but they need to know about. Because the way we develop a sustainable economy is by having a sustainable relationship with our resource base. It's by respecting our groundwater, respecting our land, respecting our air resources, respecting our communities and our, and our human resources. The, so that message needs to get out there. And one thing you need to do, you know, KJS is over there competing with everybody in the world who wants a piece of a pie that is increasingly inadequate to meet the state's needs, right? And with the restructuring of the, the view by the pension board of where our pension debt is, it's not going to get any prettier over there in terms of people trying to get resources. I don't know that we're going to see tax reform particularly since the governor said it can't be neutral. We need to raise additional revenues. And of course, that was met with a resounding silence when he gave his State of the Commonwealth address. We may or may not see it. But in the meantime, we assume that KGS is going to be trying to do more with less and is going to be faced with increasing pressures from the General Assembly in terms of its funding, even as it's going to see pressures at the, at the federal level. So what do we do? How do we make sure that you've got the resources that you need? One of them is that you need to capture the value that you are providing. Now, I can write this down. I can say, hey, there's, here's the value as an advocate for 40 some odd years. Here's what I see. Here's the, the difference that you've made in people's lives, in people's communities. But every time somebody gets on the website and they use the LIDAR, Right? They get on the website and they download a report. We need to capture, hey, was this information valuable to you? How? You collect those stories because those are compelling stories. And when it comes time to tell that story to the General Assembly, which is the second plank that needs to be, I think, expanded, there's a lot of legislators who don't know what you do. They don't have the slightest idea what you do and how much the information that you've collected should inform policy decisions regarding solid waste management, regarding resource development, regarding uh, at, you know, any sort of physical development. Because if you don't look and you don't know, you end up paying a dear price for your ignorance later on. So that value that you create is kind of a diffuse value that needs to be captured and it's a story that needs to be told. Right? Not just when you're called on to go speak to a legislative committee, but when you have any opportunities to interact, reach out and make those opportunities. We would like to come and do an annual briefing for the General Assembly, for the, the substantive committees, for the, uh, the budget committees on what we're doing, on what our strategic plan is, and on what our needs are, and what value we can produce at a fraction of the cost that you would have to pay if you went to the private sector to get that same information. And at a level of quality, because you don't have a vested interest in anything but the truth, in anything but the scientific method. Because of that, you're an honest broker. And that's a story that needs to be told. The last thing I wanna mention, and then I'll tell you about the shoes, is how do we build a constituency in the long term? Right? Think back about, about why it is that you ended up working in this field. What is it that interested you about it? When did that interest occur? Right? Kids, when they're growing up, are innately curious. They are innately in awe of nature, in all of its facets of geology, of, of water, of, of, they're just innately curious. They don't need a whole lot of prodding to be curious. Yet, by the time they reach middle school, they have had any interest in science drummed out of them. 
because of the way that we have taught or failed to teach the inquisitive scientific method. And, and we have failed to, to nurture that spark of interest. In fact, we've extinguished it. So here's something I want to suggest. And this goes back to the idea that, that you know, the KGS is over here and then the, the, you know, the public issues are over here and sometimes you're afraid to, to get in the middle of them because you're going to be attacked as being partisan or you're going to be attacked as, as tape picking sides on policy debates. But one of the things that we need to do is build a constituency of people who, who, who will tell your story. Hmm? Yeah, I, I will do that in a heartbeat. Right? But they say, yeah, but, but he's, you know, he's an advocate, he's a partisan. But, but when you have people, people value what they know and they value what they love and they value what they're familiar with. And one of the things I want to suggest is, is, is that you all partner with the, uh, with the university, with its science departments, and create opportunities for kids, for youth, for families to get out and explore the geology and the biology of the Commonwealth. Anybody ever heard of a bio blitz? Okay, bio blitz was a concept that came up, uh, E.O. Wilson was one of the people who's been touting it, but it's basically, it's an organized, it, it's organized chaos. It's a way of getting people outdoors to explore, whatever the area is, it could be this campus, it could be a city block in the middle of the west end of Louisville, it could be a park. What you do is you encourage people to come and you turn them loose. Let's do an inventory. What's here? What is here biologically? What is here geologically? How did it get here? And you have resource people that are helping to support the, the, the exploration. So kids go off and they come back with a, with a plant or they, they come back and they identify uh, a bug or they come back and they identify a rock. And you have somebody say, yeah, do you know where this came from? Why is it that there's this fossil in this rock here? What does this mean? What does it mean to be in this place? And so you develop a relationship with kids as they're going through school, that they know that, that KGS is there, that they have a wealth of information and knowledge, and they become your constituent, and they become the person that tells your story when it comes time to, uh, to look at budgets, when it comes time to look at the support that you need to do the good work that you do. Right? And so what you do is you do a bio blitz and you invite the local legislators and the local city councils and you have their families and they come out and they start getting a firsthand knowledge of what it is that you do and of the value that you bring. So don't be afraid to tell your story because it's a great story. You've got, I, I've had the privilege of working, uh, Don Haney and I worked for years, uh, Kip Cobb and I worked for years on different issues uh, over time and it has been a privilege to be associated with KGS. And I look forward, as you implement the strategic plan going forward, look forward to this organization continuing to be the go-to resource, the honest broker of information regarding geoscience and regarding uh, this amazing Commonwealth of Kentucky. So thank you all for this opportunity and I hope it's a productive day and I look forward to working with many of you in the future. I'm sorry about this. Okay, 1978. I was given these parachutes by somebody whose uncle was kind of the Imelda Marcos of Eastern Kentucky. He was, he was a shut-in who liked a good pair of shoes from Montgomery Ward. And he had about 20 pairs when he died uh, in Paintsville, and his nephew gave me these shoes. And I would never want, I'd never shine them. And they got looking a little ratty. So in 1978, Herbie Deskins, who was a Pikeville lawyer, who was the chair of the Natural Resources Committee, he said, Fitzgerald, when are you going to shine those shoes? And I should have kept my mouth shut. I turned around and said, when are you going to pass a good bill? <laughs> so it became a challenge that the shoes get shined when a good bill gets passed. They've been shined four times in the last 38 years. <laughs> and each one of those times, KGS has been involved in the conversation. When we did solid waste reform in 1991, when we did it again in 2001, KGS was at the table and was a resource about how we needed to improve our management of solid waste in the Commonwealth. So 
you've been an integral part of good things happening. Uh, and the shoes right now are on life support. I only bring them out for special occasions and for the legislative session. Thank you, Robert. <laughs>